let's see at the come on good morning everybody uh it's january 2nd and uh today is very cold in texas as well as across the whole united states of the date of this video and uh <coughs> i'm trying to uh, do this teaching video i really like to be out by the water spots and some of the videos i've done over the past year or so and the weather's not only been cold, but it's been real overcast. So in the evening, as I do my prayer time and reading, I like going out and doing a final prayer and walking in the yard, do a couple of, and I see stars, and I like that. Also in the morning, when I get up early, if I'm out right here, which I am, I see stars. So it's about a week and a half, maybe, no stars or anything because of the, over, the clouds all day and night. So yesterday I prayed, I said, I was telling my son-in-law, I miss that, being able to see those stars, to see far. And so I just prayed last night, I said, Lord, let me see one star. Now, you know, I went outside, and I looked a little last night, and I saw one star, and I said, oh, they're all going to come out, because it looked like it was breaking up, and we had the super moon, and I, so I said, I'm sure I'm going to see a bunch of them. That was the only one I seen, and it was sort of like, you know, you got what you asked for, and I was grateful for that. Now, there's a few notes, I guess I haven't made a lot of rollout videos, but we're going to do Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm a little, wasn't sure if we'll teach right here. I've got my other study in the back, another room, and so I just want to uh, do Ephesians 3. Uh, let's start it, and then if I make some more comments... I'll see if I get to those. But Paul now, picking up in our Ephesians study, which is the, if you see these in the future on the whole series of links and all, it's the next chapter, chapter 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus. Now Paul, we call this one of the prison epistles. If you remember in our study of Acts, at the end of the book of Acts, Paul was under house arrest. I'll try and link that note to self being i reviewed these uh so more than likely paul penned this one from uh, when he was in jail but also we understand from reading the new testament paul considered himself like a, a bond slave he considered himself indebted if you will a prisoner not just in the sense of the times that he was in natural prison or jail but that he was captive to for, to fulfill the calling. And he talks about in this chapter how God had picked him, the apostle of grace to the Gentiles, the whole history that we did in the book of Acts, that God had chosen Paul to declare these unsearchable riches of Christ, that this was a gift with the conversion of Paul in Acts chapter 9, and that Paul saw himself as the least of all saints, and he understood the calling that he had was something that he did not earn, deserve, because his previous life as a Pharisee, he writes about in the New Testament, that he worked hard and he strove real hard, trying to attain the righteousness of the law, which was impossible to do. And then he understood that the, all his past that he had and those endeavors and efforts of the works of the flesh, that he counted them all loss that he would have gained the righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ. And so God had gifted Paul, opening his eyes. Now in this chapter, that's what he says. God has revealed this great mystery that was hidden from all the ages. And again, we're talking about when the New Testament speaks of a mystery, it's saying it was something that was hidden, like we didn't see it fully in the Old Testament. We didn't fully understand it. Now it's interesting because the mystery he's talking about was how that the Gentiles, the message of grace that we talked about, that the Gentiles, this other people group that were considered despised, not part of the commonwealth of Israel, that were not partakers of all the blessings and the history that the Jewish people had from the prophets God's famous promise, I'm talking about the stars, to Abraham and, and Genesis 15 when God's 
took Abraham outside and uh, said, look at the stars, Abraham, look at all these. So shall your seed be, as many as all these stars that you're looking at. The same stars we see today, you see. There's not many things that you could look at tonight that Abraham looked at. I don't know if you ever thought of that. Okay. So he looks at these stars, and it says Abraham believed in the Lord, and he counted it for him to righteous for righteousness. Now that Genesis 15, those first few verses, and also we read uh, the promise in Genesis 12 that uh, get out of your country from your kindred from your father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. I'll bless those who bless thee, and I'll curse who can curse thee. And through thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, we know by the writings of Paul, because Paul says, God opened my eyes. He, he allowed me to see what all this meant. And what did it mean? And when Paul writes in Romans chapter uh, 4, and also in Galatians, he begins saying, now look at this great thing that God showed us. They all, now, all the teachers, the Pharisees and the preachers of Paul's time, they knew all these verses, okay? They knew all these stories of the great father Abraham, and, but they didn't see what was right there, okay? Now, you've got to understand that the prophets, I've been talking a lot about Isaiah the prophet the last few weeks, and they're making these proclamations. I have a verse up here where David himself, I wrote it down, uh, the, the Most High spoke through me. I, I didn't see it just now, it's up there. David said, this is, this is the thing that God blessed me with, David prophesied in the Psalms. He said, the Most High spoke through me. And David gives these great prophecies in, in the Psalms. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And Peter himself in the book of Acts will say, the Holy Spirit was speaking through David, and it was talking about Jesus. So now you have these Old Testament figures, Abraham, Isaiah. You have them speaking things and having these experiences, but yet they're not fully understanding everything. Now, when God told Abraham, see those stars, through thy seed, will all the families of the earth be blessed. And Paul will teach in the New Testament letters, Paul will say, He saith not to seeds, as of many, but to one seed, that is Christ. Therefore, when Abraham had that experience in Genesis that I was quoting to you, he believed, in a way, the gospel. Though it wasn't fully understood, the way we now, Paul says, are understanding it. But he believed it. Because it says, God counted it to him for righteousness. And Jesus himself, in the Gospel of John, says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he was glad. And they said to Jesus, you are not even 50 years old. Look, he was 30-something. But it was taking a toll on him. Before Abraham was... I am. So now, they were seeing these great things, but they were seen through a glass, if you will, darkly. Again, Paul from Corinthians. But now what he's saying in this chapter is God has now revealed this, re the deep truths that what these promises were talking about, and how is this relevant for all of us today? These promises were talking about God's embracing and redeeming of man. And Paul teaches about that experience that Abraham had and said, and Abraham is not just the great father of the Jewish people, which of course he is, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but that he would be the father of all that would follow in the same lines of faith. Because he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, the circumcision of the flesh, but of the heart. And then Paul will teach in, when did that experience happen with Abraham? When God, that the one I just taught you, after he was circumcised or before he was circumcised? 
And that experience of Genesis 15, where God had counted him righteous, was before circumcision. Therefore, this is not an ethnic gospel. This is not just a particular, this is for the whole world, for all nations. And to Paul, this great understanding, it was right in these scriptures all along. And when Isaiah says, the Lord himself is going to give you a sign, a virgin is going to conceive and bear a child, did he have all the understanding of those things? I don't believe they fully understood those things because they were prophesying. And it's interesting because in this chapter we're in Ephesians 3. As Paul unfolds it, he says, but this mystery, this thing that was hidden, this God and the Gentiles being fellow heirs, is now, this is now revealed that we are all united in Christ in one body. And it says, and it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. And without going too far, it's interesting because sometimes we read about the, uh, the church foundation upon the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. We also read other uh, verses in the New Testament, even Revelation, but you're seeing sometimes when it says the apostles and prophets, sometimes it's referring to the Old Testament prophets, kind of referring to natural Israel, and then to the New Testament apostles, sometimes kind of referring to all of the church or all of the Gentiles as well. 24 elders in the book of Revelation. So some say that's typical of like the 12 tribes and as well as the 12 apostles and God bringing them all together. But in Ephesians, Paul later, we're going to get to him saying the apostles and prophets and evangelists past his teachers, talking about the New Testament. But also in a way, it says these things were hidden, but they are now revealed. At this time, at this stage, in the time of the church, first century, up till this moment, it says now they were revealed to the holy apostles and prophets. And you know, uh, I think it's applying there to the New Testament prophets where God was beginning to reveal. But look, Isaiah, the people I'm speaking about, David, they're in the presence of God. And even in that first century, when Paul's saying, now God's opening it up through the church. All these mysteries, the manifold wisdom of God is now being revealed to all these principalities and powers, to the rulers, we're going to get to later in Ephesians, the rulers of darkness of this world, the rest of the uh, warfare we're in. But understand, there is also some Old Testament prophets, if you will, who went on to be with the Lord, Says, talks about this in Hebrews 11. They likened the stands. And then they, they saw the fulfillment of all the promises of God taking place in the church and the people of God. So even God was revealing these mysteries through us, through the people of God, to even the prophets that prophesied. Them. And we're in the presence of God and then said, oh, I could imagine maybe Isaiah saying, or David or others, I, rem uh, I remember when I prophesied that thing, the Most High spoke through me, David said. And, and maybe they said, oh, wow, that's what that was talking about. You see, the gift of sometimes in that particular gift of prophecy and the prophetic office, sometimes there are things spoken uh, that uh, the prophets themselves are not fully comprehending what they're speaking. Because they're speaking by inspiration of God. And so I think it's inter even interesting that at the time of the church, Paul says, now it's being revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. Even the ones that have gone on to be with the Lord, if you will. All right. Um, Paul says it was by revelation God revealed this great mystery of the church and of the Gentiles. I'll read a little bit. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto him that least of all saints was this grace given. So Paul understood this great ministry. I watched a couple of uh, documentaries the last week or two. One I was glad to catch. It was a movie, but I wanted to see it when it came out. I believe it was called Silence. 
but I remember reading the write-up, and I don't watch a whole lot of movies, unless it's maybe something like a documentary of the real life thing. Well, Silence, when I read it, it's a Martin Scorsese film about these priests. And I remember reading it, I said, oh, I, it's a historical account. And then as I watched it, uh, Liam Neeson, I believe, is in it. But it was a good movie, and I remember teaching that history where the movie occurred at the time place. If now, I didn't study it again just recently, but I think it's the 1600s. But it was right in that period of time, 15, 1600s. But it was the story of Nagasaki. The Catholic priests that were evangelizing the Japanese. Now, I did teach this history in the past. I'll probably link this. But as the Catholic Church began reaching out to uh, going to areas where the Protestant Reformation was not really spreading to, and so now the Catholics were going in uh, into China, into Japan, so forth. But then there, this was the story of the movie. There were these priests that eventually the Japanese wanted to tamp down on the evangelization of Japanese people into the church, into the Catholic faith. And so then there was a persecution, and I taught this in the past, and they even, I remember, it didn't talk about it, or it might have mentioned it in the movie, but they even crucified the priests along the road in the famous city of Nagasaki, where in the 20th century, as most of us know, <coughs> was one of the cities <coughs> that the United States dropped the bomb on, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But the past history of it at that time, I think 1600s, uh, it was a persecution against the priests, and they killed them. They killed them. And the debate at that time was between two Catholic orders. Now I'm going to really go back in memory. I think it was the Franciscans and the Dominicans. But the problem was the reason that there was the Japanese then turned against the Christians there, was one of those orders, um, whether it's the Franciscans, the Dominicans, but one of them as they were evangelizing the Japanese, they kind of practiced what we call syncretism. Syncretism meant when you go to another culture and you begin evangelizing people. We have some of this, a lot of this is the history, and some of it's critical of the America and the Indians, okay? We see the same thing. And there's a lot of documentaries on sort of a criticism of uh, Europeans or Catholics or Protestants trying to evangelize Indians and so forth. And you had the same type of thing going on with the Japanese. Now, syncretism was a teaching, a belief that said you can embrace Jesus Christ and the faith, and then they sort of taught different groups, not just in this occasion, that you could mix in your also other religion can kind of remain with it. And so some that were converting, whether it be American Indians or uh, others, some kind of said, well, we'll also bring our other beliefs in with it. Okay? Now, one of the Catholic orders, when they went into Japan later on, they realized, wait a minute, some of the other Catholic uh, priests were converting them and telling them, yeah, you can kind of keep all your other religious system as well and mix it in. And then the other order came in and said, no, no, if you're going to convert to true Christianity, which was the gospel message, as they understood at that time, they said, you can't have all the other beliefs coming in with it, all right? Now, I'm not going to debate that now. But that's what caused, in my teaching of the history in the past, that's what really caused then the retaliation against those priests. Because then they, that became a controversy. But it was interesting for me to watch that movie. It was called Silence. And they tried to get those priests, they, they pronounced the word wrong. And I didn't want to be critical of it, but I mentioned it to my wife. She wasn't really watching it, but... Uh, but there's a word about apostasy, and apostasizing, apostasize, which means you've forsaken the faith. 
but they kept pronouncing it apostatize, apostatize. And I believe they were just saying it wrong, and it was fine. So whoever was, you know, giving them what they're supposed to say as they're producing the movie, sometimes they do that with the word prophecy as well. Prophesy. Pro and sometimes, I think they did that in The Matrix, prophesized. Uh, but they, it, a way that they might just say a little, it's not grammatically correct. It might spell on the spell check. Okay. So. Let's do. Let's uh, finish Ephesians three. That was a little history. I'll, I'll throw it in. Now Paul says, "Now that what God has done, and unto me whom less than least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach, among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ." was talking about the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And I did Genesis 1 the last few weeks. And God said and God spoke what there'd be like. Jesus, the Word of God, and it says in that verse, uh, verse 9 of Ephesians 3, made all things by Jesus Christ. All right? And we can do a lot on teaching that. But some of you could see further into that as you read and others, maybe not as much you can see, but it's all true, okay? And and God will unfold links to us in our day. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So it's interesting because what that's really saying is now God's interaction with us, the people of God in the church. It, God is revealing all of this manifold wisdom to even the powers in the heavens. Even angels desire to look into this. And so why is this wisdom of God? Uh, why is it now being revealed through people who have been redeemed and that us as humans, even at this stage in our redemption history, meaning we're not yet raised from the dead physically. Though we do read in this letter, as well as the others of the New Testament, that we have been raised and seated with him. Paul teaches this positional place we're in now, meaning spiritually we have this resurrection connection. But then Paul also refutes in his other letters those who taught that the physical resurrection already happened. Okay, now, that's a distinction in the letters. Once again, I was watching a documentary a few weeks ago, and the scholars were very critical. They were called higher critics. And some said, we know Paul didn't write Ephesians. And they were also challenging some of the others. It said, because in this letter, Paul says, we are raised together with Christ. He does. Chapter 2, he did that. We are uh, for by grace, so you say, through faith, and then out of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are uh, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Who has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So Paul says, we have died, we're united in death, burial, and resurrection, and even seated with Christ. Now, spiritually, that's where we are right now in God's eyes. Seated and joined with Christ. That physical resurrection of the body has not taken place yet. So in the other letters, some of the other uh, New Testament letters, Paul rebukes and says, some say the resurrection has already happened. Uh, these, these are the letters to the Thessalonians, if I remember. And Paul says, no, uh, those that say the resurrection has passed, has happened already, that's not true. And then he debates that. So was Paul contradicting? No. He, we have the teachings that we are raised together with him right now, spiritually, united with Christ. Seek those things which are above. I was teaching the other day from Colossians. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, what Christ said at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. So that's a present 
then we have and when he appears. We're also going to have a resurrection, okay? But why does God choose now to reveal all these mysteries, that we, the verse we just read, through the church and to the angels, to or the saints who died and went to be with the Lord, but were not really living in our time period, and yet God's revealing all this. Because remember, the great mystery of God becoming man, which we just taught recently, these last few weeks, the incarnation, is God, the incarnation, Jesus Christ, God among us, through Christ, and then us receiving the Spirit of God after the ascension of Jesus to the right hand of the Father, position authority. The Spirit now comes and dwells in us, which we are called the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ on earth, and Jesus is physically raised from the dead and at the right hand of the Father. But now understand, the Spirit of God is now dwelling in a people, a community, a church. And, and it's in that body, once again, on this earth, in the people of God, that God is speaking, communicating, and revealing. So we too, as the body of Christ, have this union that allows this mystery, things to be unfolded where other people can see, and even spiritual creation angels and principalities and all these things, whether they be fallen angels or whether they just be regular angels. And so God is doing it through the church. That's really what's my it's really a great mystery. <laughs> okay. How long did I go? I don't want to go too long, all right? And let's see, wherefore I desire <coughs> that you don't faint at my tribulations for you. Paul's going through struggles if he was in jail more than likely when he penned it. He says, no, no, this is for your benefit. This is when I'm going through these struggles, Paul says, the things that are happening to me, it's for your benefit. And look at what he's doing. When he was in jail, he was penning letters, sending them out, and he would say at times, though I am bound, the word of God is not bound. You know, I like to go to places. Today I would have preferred to teach somewhere by North Beach or something. And I feel confined. I won't be in all day. But... I feel confined if I'm even just like, I want to go to other cities a lot just to get out. But then you, we got to remember, I wrote that verse just the other day, actually. I must go to other cities also, wrote that a while ago, but even by the places that you have not gone with your feet. So it's through the communication of the gospel, whether it be a letter you write, video you make, or whatever, remember, you're going. John says, the Lord carried me away in the spirit into a great and high mountain. John in the book of Revelation. So if you are limited, sitting in a prison cell or whatever, remember the word of God is not found. You have opportunity to communicate the gospel. And that's an extension. That's you communicating, speaking through prayer. Through prayer you can uh, accomplish great things. And if you feel there are times where you're limited geographically through prayer, let your doctrine drop down like rain. Let your speech distill like you that everyone would receive of these words. And you, and you speak the word of God and it goes forth. And, and it produces, okay? Let me end. And to that you would know the love of Christ. I'll just read a few at the end. Be able to be able to comprehend with all saints with the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, the famous verse, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. He can do more than we ask or think, according to the Spirit of God that's working in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without, and amen. When I read the chapter the other day, getting ready to talk about it, the one that stuck with me is, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power and the one I just read. So God is really doing all of this in us. It is he that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. 
I read one chapter the other night in Isaiah, just, it was like a, and I do read, every few days I'll read a devotional way, like a chapter in Isaiah, I guess it was 45, but the theme was, many of the verses of Isaiah, quote, a lot of times is, where is the house that you build unto me, where is the work of my hands, have not my hands made all these things, and all these things have been, a lot of the themes are, uh, God has done this. Whatever God's doing in you, it's important for you to stay focused on. It's God that's working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That it's not an effort of you. You've been drawn into the calling wherever you're at in your life, and that it's God doing that through you. And, and to stay focused on that, come up to the mountain and be there. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. The foundation of the Lord standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone that aims the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So your stance and position is you're in the presence of God. God's the one that's building the things, all right? With this a scripture about Moses, I think I got it up here. Moses truly was faithful in all this house as a servant for testimony of those things which be spoken after. That's from Hebrews. But you know, as, as I even look at the story of Moses in the Old Testament, and there's a psalm that says, all the people came up with banners around the ark, the testimony, which is a type of the word of God, the incarnate word, that ark of the covenant. And they were given praises unto God. And it said there were thrones, even the set thrones of David. Multiple, I quoted those verses the other day on the other video. Jesus, it says, on Jesus' head there were many crowns. And then there's a verse in the gospel where Jesus says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Now, I understand the context of those. But Jesus also, there's one up here that's saying, I will allow you in my father's house in many mansions. As you're faithful to God, then you, you have an influence in, in more than just one, if you will, room or group. Or When you're faithful to God, I wrote this a long time ago, He that overcometh will inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And so... Through God working in us as the church and our grace that God's given to us to communicate what Paul is talking about, God will reveal things. But it's all by his spirit. That's what Paul teaches in the letters and the gifts. He said that, uh, the letters talking about the gifts of the spirit. He says to one is given this, to one is given that. And the importance of all the members of the body so we're all functioning, and we're all playing a role. As every one of you has received these gifts, these, the manifold wisdom of God. I've got another verse up there, but it says, As every man has received a gift, even so many of us minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I don't even know that might have been in the chapter I'm talking about. I wrote that a while ago. All right, so... We'll end it with that. Paul, the main thing of Ephesians 3 is Paul says, this is this great mystery. I'm showing it to you guys because they were Gentiles. The Ephesian church, Ephesian Gentiles that believed when Paul preached there. And he says, this is a wonderful thing that God has now opened up the doors to all these benefits for you guys, for all of you that thought you were not in it. <laughs> he says, no, through Jesus, God's brought you guys in. Okay. So I bless, let me pray. Father, I thank you for all of our friends, everybody that uh, gets to follow along with the videos and the posts. I pray that you would bless them and that they too, Lord, would communicate and speak and share the message. It's, Paul said the love of God was it's beyond what we can comprehend. So we're into this romance with God, the bride, the bridegroom. And so I pray that we would just be able to enter into that and that the people of God uh, would do the things that you've called us to do and that we would come forth out of relationship. I pray a blessing on each one. In Jesus' name, amen.